So, good afternoon. My name is uh, Shai Sela. Uh, I'm a PhD student here in Ben Gurion under the supervision of Tal uh, Svorai and Shmuel Sulin. And I will talk today about the echo hydrological feedbacks between surface ceiling and woody vegetation in dry climates. We have uh, financing from two uh, bodies, the ISF and the YALC, and we thank them for that. And this talk will be uh, uh, divided into two parts. The first part will be an introduction about the sea layer effect on soil water content on the hill slope scale. And the second part of the talk will discuss the feedbacks within this sea layer and woody vegetation. And the specific questions we will address is how does the uh, presence of a sea layer affect vegetation root water uptake? Our sea layer woody vegetation feedbacks are they constant in time, or are they connected into the interannual variability of the rainfall, or within season variability? And the third question will be that assuming dryland vegetation goes into a period of stress when the soil potential drops below some arbitrary threshold, does the presence of a sea layer affect the duration of the period under stress? So we will get to all these questions later. First, a quick introduction, and I will, uh, I did not know that Shmuel will use some of the slides that he used, so you will see some duplicates here, so I will go quickly on them. Uh, this is from Le Havim, uh, 15 kilometers north from here. You can see uh, patches of vegetation. Now, we have seen in this uh, talks quite a, a remarkable patches, uh, formations. You have the stripes or the uh, spots. And on our study sites, it's, it's, you can't really see uh, clear patterns. But what you can see is uh, source and sink relations. OK, I hope you can see this uh, photo thing. When you have the patch, the patch is surrounded by bare soil. This bare soil gets crusted. And it acts as a source for uh, water runoff generated, which infiltrates into the patch. So we have all kind of uh, crust, uh, crusting in the field. We have, uh, as would, uh, uh, suggested, some uh, biological crusting. And we have also physical crusting. In this talk today, I will only approach the physical crusting uh, of the soil. And I will not go into very much detail about the mathematical description, because Shmuel just did it. And it is a compacted layer at the soil surface. You all know that by now. It affects significantly the water content on the, seal, uh, on the soil profile underneath it. So a quick uh, introduction. Traditionally, studies of surface sealing focused on the context of runoff generation. Okay, You have dozens uh, of uh, studies in the uh, literature that discuss this. This is a synthetic catchment. This is from the work of Asudin and Mu'alem. Uh, 2006. Synthetic catchment is a 30 millimeter total rainfall with 40 millimeters per hour rainfall intensity. On the y axis, you have the cumulative runoff. On the x is the time. You've seen this slide in the last presentation. What you can see that if you do not account for sealing, you do not get any runoff. So you must have a, the seal layer to generate the runoff. Second example from the work of Ivanov et al., 2008 is that primary production at the valleys of a catchment are closely coupled with runoff which is generated on the hill slope. If you do not account for sealing, you have different primary production patterns on the valleys of the catchment. You can compare on the right the catchment, synthetic catchment with uh, surface sealing. On the left is when you disregard the sealing. And as Shmuel also discussed this uh, slide, the sea layer was also found to have a strong effect on evaporation. And this aspect is usually disregarded. disregarded. And it is very important to um, account for it. On the, you have here two soil uh, profiles. Uh, the first uh, one was uh, flooded, well, wetted by flooding. The second one was wetted by rainfall, artificial rainfall, thus creating a crust at the surface. And this is the evaporation, community evaporation on the y-axis against the wetting depth. And you can see that the crusted 
soil profile has less evaporation. It sup suppresses evaporation from the soil. And this is, was shown in 1970, that's close to 45 years ago. This is a, from our paper last year. What you see here is the water content in two soil profiles. The green curve is the water content of a sealed profile. The brown is the water content of an unsealed profile. And this is a 40 centimeter profile of a silty loam soil. And the storm which is simulated is quite intense. It has 15 millimeters per hour intensity for the duration of one hour. And if this will work, yeah, as you can see on the onset of the storm, on the uh, purple, you can see the runoff generated only on the sealed profile. And consequently, in the following days following the storm, the sealed profile is drier. But after three to four days, this trend is reversed. And by a week of drying, the sealed profile is wetter than the unsealed profile. And what's happening is that the sea layer dries much faster. and It has a lower conductivity, and it just suppresses the evaporation from the profile. And by the time the next simulated storm arrives, uh, the seal profile remains favorable in water content, is wetter throughout the end of the simulation. So we wanted to test how does this, OK, so the sea layer compensates for runoff by reducing evaporation flux. We wanted to test how is this affecting hill slope scale patterns. And we had uh, done this by uh, aggregating 8,240 1D cells, Hydros 1D cells. Uh, this is the software we were using, Hydros 1D. It, it's based on high resolution data sets of topographic and soil parameters we collected at the field. And the sea layer is characterized by the Mu'alim in a Suling approach. And this model was verified extensively during the 2010-2011 rainfall seasons. We have 82 special locations which we came back after each storm and before the next storm repeatedly throughout the entire season and we collected gravimetric uh, soil samples. And altogether we have close to 800 uh, samples. Each one of them was three replicas. So close to 2,500 soil samples that we took out of this hill slope. There's still some soil left there. And after analyzing all these samples, we could validate our model. And what you can see that Shmuel already uh, showed in the last presentation, that we did not account for sealing. You, uh, high, you have overestimation of uh, evaporation fluxes. Okay? You can see that the brown curve, which is the a hill slope when you do not account for a ceiling has, um, it dries up too fast and it doesn't uh, match the uh, measured data, which is the black, the black circles. So now that we know that the seal affects substantially the soil water content on the hill slope scale, I want to show you some animation, okay? On the left, you have the hill slope when you account for sealing. We have a sea layer on the surface of each of these 8,000 independent soil cones. Okay? On the right, you have the same hill slope, the same 8,000 cells, but without the sea layer. And this is the legend, this is the water content. When you have the red color, is the dry water content. It's very intuitive. The blue is the wetter. And on the bottom here, the panel, you'll see that this is an extract from a season. This is 2006, 2007 season. And I'm just going to show a few storms out of this season so you can sense what's the dynamics of the water content on the hill slope. So we will progress through the season. And as you can see, when you have, well, the colors are not really uh, showing in this projector, but you have the interfluve section here on the middle of the hill slope, which is very shallow. So uh, it's getting filled much quicker and high, higher water content. And it's basically the same in the sealed and unsealed system. You can see also we are here. This is the average mean, the average hill slope uh, water content, which is quite similar. And then as we enter the drying period, you can see that on the right side, the unsealed system dries much faster. We've seen it from the uh, single simulation before. And it has quite 
remarkable spatial pattern. It dries from the interflow, from the, the of course, the dry um, segments, the shallow segments dry first. It is very evident on the unsealed surface, on the unsealed hill slope. But after 12 days of uh, drying, you have a very different pattern of hill slope. This is a root zone depth uh, water content. So this brings us to the research question, the first research question. How does the presence of a sea layer affect vegetation root water uptake? The first step would be to acquire realistic root water uptake parameters of the dominant shrub of the study site. But this is quite a challenge because there's very limited data on the literature regarding root water uptake parameters for natural vegetation. You can open the Hydros catalog, you have dozens of crops, you have the parameters ready, someone has studied it and published it, so you can use it. But if you're looking for the Sarcopotorium spinosum parameters, which is the uh, shrub at the study site, it practically does not exist. So we went to the uh, study site, we collected seedlings of this shrub, and we grew them in the lab, or actually in the uh, hothouse, Hamama and we grew them for one year until they were big enough, mature enough, and we have set up a lysimeter experiment. And what is basically is uh, the shrubs are sitting on high resolution weights, which are monitoring the weight of the bucket with the shrubs, and they've been uh, wet, wetted and, uh, and through the drying and wetting periods of the season, and you have also the Drainage out of the, of the buckets is also monitored and into a very high resolution weights here. And this allowed us to have 15 individual data sets of water content change okay, in these buckets. Um, and this data set used to va validate or calibrate uh, five parameters of the FEDES function. And I did that using a matchup code and uh, optimized the parameter. And I used a Latin hypercube sampling approach to ensure all of the parameter, uh, parameter space will be sampled. And these are the results. You can see so that we have quite good agreement. In the end, this is the uh, results of the average of the best 10% of the simulations. And most of the parameters were quite similar for uh, the free shrubs, except for the P3 parameter, which it terminates the transpiration on the a drying uh, edge of the water regime, which is a bit more variable, but uh, they were quite similar. So once we have these parameters, we can go back into the hydros and do some modeling. This is a 2D transect, which is 30 centimeters depth, uh, 3 meters long. It has a 10 degrees slope inclination. Excuse me. And what you can see is it has a two layers. The dark blue layer is representing of a sea layer. And uh, here, I, know, I don't know if you can see it by the projector. And underneath it, the, the light blue is the underlying soil. And the sea layer was characterized by the Moalem and Asuling approach. And it was assumed to be two centimeter thickness. And just so you can sense the difference in connectivity, the underneath, uh, underlying soil has a 3.2 centimeters per hour conductivity, while the sea layer has 0 0.06, so it's roughly 1 or 2 percent of the underlying soil. I illustrated, I probably don't see it here, huh? but the, there is a transect, well, there's a the, all of the profile underneath the shrub was considered to be a root zone, and we do not have any lateral root distribution, not in these uh, simulations here. And regarding the boundary condition, in the hydros, they have what they call an atmospheric boundary condition, which is basically a flux boundary condition. It's open to external forces of rainfall and evaporation. On the sides, I used uh, the gradient boundary condition. This is um, mimicking a uh, continuous hill slope from the top of the bottom of the transect. And on the bottom, we used a free drainage uh, boundary condition. And why is that? Because this is how the subsurface look in the study site. It is very disintegrated, and it has 
the underlying rock has a lot of uh, cracks and fissures. And how can you calibrate or how can you decide what is an adequate flux for the bottom uh, boundary condition here? So we used a free drainage, and that actually works the best for the validation of the model, of the 1D model that I've uh, shown before. Okay, so this is some results. On the y-axis, you have the root zone potential, okay, the potential of the uh, soil where the uh, roots are located. On the x, you have the time, the season, as you progress. And on the red, you have the unsealed uh, system. On the blue, you have the sealed system. And you can see that every time there is a drying period, you have a marked difference between the uh, soil potential of the sealed and unsealed system. Okay, we're showing here, this is a wet season, wetter than average, uh, 407 millimeters. And if we look on the corresponding root water uptake of the sh uh, simulated shrub, you can see that there's close to 10% difference by the end of the season. Okay, so this is for a wet, uh, higher than average season. If you look on a drier or drier than average season, you can see that these differences are much larger. There's much uh, longer drying periods and there's more time for the sea layer to suppress the evaporation, okay, compared to the unsealed system. And it's much more effective in these seasons. So consequently, you have close to 40% difference in root water uptake of the shrubs by the end of this season. So this is quite significant, and the, the sea layer is a positive feedback for the shrub uh, under these uh, simulations. So what I have here is long-term data. This is 15 uh, rainfall seasons. On the red, you have the uh, cumulative root water uptake of the sealed transect. On the yellow, the cumulative root water uptake of the unsealed one. And what I want to show you here is that the sealed system is always preferable. It always has higher root water uptake compared to the unsealed one. Okay? And if I take the, the ratio between the root water uptake on the sealed and the unsealed system, okay, on the y-axis here, against the annual, the total annual rainfall amount, um, you can see that first it's always higher than one because the sealed system has always higher root water uptake. But this effect is augmented during the drying, the dry seasons. Okay, in wet season here it's close to one or maybe. 10, 1.1 to 10% difference. And when, as you go to drier season, this effect is augmented, and by the, drying, uh, the dry season, you have close to 30, 40% difference. But interestingly, for similar rainfall, total rainfall amount, you can find very different uh, root water uptake, okay? Or the efficiency of the seal in enhancing root water uptake is, can be very different for the same uh, total rainfall amount. So this brings me to, brings me to the second research question. Are the sea layer woody vegetation feedbacks, are they constant in time or are they connected into interannual or within season climate variability? So let's first look at the uh, analysis for the whole season. Okay, so this is the cumulative fluxes of the whole uh, rainfall season. Uh, you can see here the storage calculated, the uh, total infiltration, when it's total evaporation, when it's total bottom uh, flux. And you can see the difference between the systems is quite similar, okay? So the difference in root water uptake cannot be explained solely by the total cumulative fluxes. And could this difference be explained by the seasonal uh, rainfall distribution? If you look on the uh, first season here, this one has a higher root water uptake ratio. And you can see that the uh, rainfall uh, events are quite evenly spaced, and uh, there's a lot of time for the seal system to suppress the evaporation and to enhance the root water uptake. So consequently, ah, okay. And if you look on the, on the second season, you can see that this season is very different. You can see that the entire rainfall amount or most of it was um, at the second half of the season, so there's a strong bias towards the end of the season. 
And if we want to check the, the corresponding root for the optic for these two seasons, you can see that this is the potential for the first season here. That you have the big differences between uh, the systems and evenly spaced storms. And consequently, you have a higher ratio between the root water optic. If you look on the second season, where it has very little uh, rain in the beginning of the season, which is concentrated towards the end, you can see that it's very dry soil, very low potential, okay? Very dry conditions during this uh, beginning of the season, the first half. And this season, these uh, potentials are actually quite, they're lower than the uh, threshold of the FEDES function, okay? So it terminates the transpiration. So consequently, the entire first half of the season has, according to the model, no root water uptake at all. And by the time the season starts, the seal area has less time to uh, suppress the evaporation and enhance root water uptake. So this is the difference between the seasons. So if you look on for the same rainfall amount or similar rainfall amount, you have completely different cumulative root water uptake. There's 47% more uh, uptake on the sealed system and 30% more uptake on the unsealed system for the same rainfall amount. So the temporal variability of the rainfall events and the drying periods are crucial in getting uh, the dynamics of root water uptake. Now, for each combination of vegetation and soil, there could be a unique soil potential value in which the vegetation starts to decrease transpiration. They close their stomata to prevent uh, internal water losses. And we have no data about what is this uh, soil potential for the Sarcopotherium spinosum. So he has all kind of uh, uh, thresholds in the literature. We decided to take a four megapascal uh, potential as an arbitrary threshold, okay? I'm not saying that this particular shrub goes into stress in this uh, value. It might be before, it might be later. This is just a threshold to demonstrate the effect of the sea layer. Demon demonstrate the feedbacks of the sea layer with these shrubs. So this is the last question. Are dry land vegetation, if they go into a period of stress, when the soil potential drops below 4 megapascal. Does the presence of a cellar affect this duration of the period under stress? And you can see here on the y-axis, this is the percentage of time below 4 megapascal, the potential of 4 megapascal. On the x, you have that total uh, annual rainfall amount. And you can see that the sea layer clearly reduces the duration in which vegetation is in stress. On average, for the entire 15th season, you have 30% decrease in vegetation stress time when you look at 4 megapascal threshold. And as expected, this duration increases as the total rainfall amount decreases. So when you have dry seasons, you have 15, 60% of the time which the system is in stress. And if we look on the ratio between the, the duration, the stress duration time on the sealed and the unsealed system, you can see here on the, on the y-axis against the total rainfall amount that it's not really connected into the annual rainfall amount. So all these deviations from uh, of the ratio are connected into variability within the season of uh, the rainfall uh, storm. So we must account for that, as I said before. So, I'm coming to my conclusions. The presence of a sea layer affects significantly root water uptake of woody vegetation. This effect is augmented during dry seasons. Root water uptake is affected by the distribution of the rainfall events for the, for the seasons and the duration of the drying intervals between them. The sea layer is an efficient mechanism which reduces the duration in which vegetation is in stress. And this efficiency is dependent on within season variability of rainfall events and drying period. And I have to add that we don't know for, for the shrub simulated here, how is this stress connected into stomatal, stomata closure? So we need to validate this maybe in the field, but this is the model results uh, of the effect of the sea layer. I can highlight two 
directions for future work. Uh, we can uh, check how are these feedbacks affected by different slope angles and profile depth, thus representing different hill slope locations, okay? And how are these feedbacks affected by change in vegetation cover, for example, from grazing or erosion? And this uh, direction uh, we will look in the near future, I hope. Thank you. Time for questions. Um, this may be to both uh, you oh, and you. Uh, Shmuel. Um, you know, soil textural effects have got to be a big deal here, you know, and in and, and particular, you can almost envision a, the, the other case, and I'm thinking of the Atacama Desert in, in Chile, where it's a wind-driven process primarily, there's almost no rain, and so you get this kind of, uh, this kind of rock uh, uh, a pavement effect, which is not really sealed, but it's mechanically desert, isolated, and it desert creates... Desert pavement. Yeah, desert pavement. So I'm wondering uh, if you can speak a little bit to the breadth of textures that, that you guys have looked at and, and, and some of the kind of uh, breakpoints where sealing in certain texture soils becomes less important or more important. Okay, so in our study site, uh, basically a silty loam soil, we didn't have that much of variation in soil texture. We had um, more uh, accumulation of uh, clay towards the uh, downside of the, the slope, okay? but it was close to 10 to 15 percent of difference. So it's not that much of a difference, so I can't really speak about different soil textures. Maybe Shmuel can add more about Maybe that. Maybe from the, from the literature a little bit, or yeah. experience. Shmuel, do you want to add here? Thank you. 